Just a quick reminder before we get into the lesson to download the hands-on lab exercises that accompany this full CCNA course. I'll include the link in the description. Also, remember to subscribe and hit the notifications bell so you don't miss any of the lessons in the course. Okay, let's get into it. In this lecture, you'll learn about the OSPF, DR and BDR designated routers. You saw in the last lecture that when you enable OSPF on a router's interface, the router will send hello packets out that interface, trying to discover other OSPF routers that it can form an adjacency with. When two OSPF routers on the same link send hello packets to each other, they will first off move into the two-way state where they've discovered each other. They will then move into the exchange state where they will agree to exchange routing updates with each other. They'll then move through loading where they're exchanging the updates. And finally, they'll be at the full state where they are fully adjacent and they've shared all of their routing information with each other. And on point-to-point -point links, OSPF router pairs will always form a full adjacency. It's a point-to-point -point link, so there can only be two routers there. So, of course, they're one, going to want to share their full information with each other. But on multi-access segments, such as Ethernet, where there can be multiple routers, it's inefficient for all routers to form a full OSPF adjacency with each other. If you look at the example here, you can see I've got an Ethernet segment. All four routers are plugged into the switch and on their interfaces connected to that switch, they're all in the same IP subnet. So I've got R1 with 10.0.0.1 slash 24, R2 with dot two, R3 with dot three, and R4 with dot four. So in the example, they've all got OSPF enabled on their interfaces, so they're going to be sharing OSPF information out on this link here. And if you think about it, it would be inefficient if that was a full mesh, if they were all sharing the full information with each other, because there would be a lot of repetitive information there being sent out onto the same link. So a better idea would be if one of these routers could be elected as a type of master, and then all the routers could share their information with the master, and then it could reflect that information out to the other routers. So rather than having a full mesh, they just send information to the master, and it's up to the master to reflect it out. And that is exactly what happens. And what the master is called is the DR, the designated router. Now, because we do have a master there, obviously that could cause a problem if the master goes down particularly if a router, say, has just sent an update to that master and then the master goes down before it can send that update to the other routers, well, that information would be lost. That would be a problem. So because of that, we want to have some redundancy here. So as well as having the, the master, the DR, the designated router, we're also going to have a BDR that's a backup designated router as well, just in case the DR goes down. Okay, so let's look and see how this works. So as I just said, a DR, designated router, and a BDR, backup designated router, are elected on each multi-axis segment. If I go back to the diagram again here, you can see all my routers, they've got an interface connected to the same multi-axis segment. So the DR and the BDR, it acts at the interface level, not at the entire router level. If, for example, R1 had another interface which was also connected to an Ethernet segment, that separate segment would also have its own DR and BDR elected as well. So the DR and BDR, it's at the interface level, and it works like this on all multi-access segments, such as Ethernet. The router with the highest priority becomes the DR, and the router with the second highest priority, not surprisingly, becomes the BDR. The default priority on the routers is one, and the higher the number, the better, the more preferred. The possible values are zero to 255, with 255 being the best possible value. If you configure a value of zero, that means that that router will never be the designated router. And the highest router ID is used in the case of a tie. So if you don't explicitly set the priority, 
all the routers on the link are all going to have the same priority of one. We still need to have a DR elected. The one that is going to be elected is the DR is the one with the highest router ID. And in the real world, that is what will typically happen. Because if you've got routers that are connected to the same link, they're probably going to be very similar model of routers anyway. This does really not put a lot of load on routers. So you, normally you're not going to really care which one is the DR. You just need to understand how this works so that if you do have problems, you can troubleshoot it. But as far as configuring anything, typically real world, you'll just leave the routers to figure it out themselves as to which one is going to be the DR. In the CCNA exam, you might be asked to configure one as the DR flow. So you need to understand how this works and you need to know how to configure priority as well. Okay, when this happens, so on multi-axis segments such as Ethernet, the routers elect the DR and BDR at the two-way stage. If you remember the stages from the last lecture, when the routers have not discovered each other yet, the OSPF state is down. They then send hellos when they discover each other through the hello messages, then they move to the two-way stage. So at the two-way stage, they have not started exchanging any routing information yet. They then move through the exchange, the loading, and the full states. So with the DR and the BDR election, that happens at the two-way stage before routing information has been exchanged. And if you think about it, that makes sense because we don't want all the routers exchanging the full information with each other, just with the DR and the BDR. So we need to have this set up before routing information is exchanged between the routers. Now, the election just happens on multi-axis segments. On the router, it knows that that interface is an Ethernet interface, so it knows that there needs to be a DR elected there. If there was another, say, a serial interface with a point-to-point -point link, then the router knows that that is a point-to-point -point link, and there's not going to be a DR elected on that link. There are a few types of connections which could be either point-to-point -point or multi-point, like that can happen with frame relay, which is not covered in the CCNA anymore. And some of those older legacy interfaces, you do need to specify whether it's point-to-point -point or a multi-axis segment, but for the CCNA exam, you don't need to know that. Okay, so if we do want to manually set which of the routers is the DR, we use the command, again, this is at the interface level. So I've got interface, fast Ethernet, zero slash zero, IP or SPF product A100. As long as you set it more than one, that is going to be the preferred router. If you wanted to configure a DR and a BDR, you could configure the DR with 100, for example, and the BDR with 50, for example. If you want to specify that a router will not become a designated router, then you can set IP or SPF product A0 on the interface. Now, after you've configured this command on the interface, it's not going to actually make anything happen. It's not going to take effect until OSPF has been restarted on that interface. So how could you do that? Well, you could reboot the router, or you could shut down the interface and then bring it back up again, or at the enable prompt, you could use the clear IP OSPF command to restart the OSPF process. Obviously, all of those would be disruptive, so be careful if you're going to do it in a production environment. The DR and BDR establish full neighbor state with all routers on the network segment. The neighbor state of other routers remains in a two-way state and they do not directly exchange routes with each other. So, for example, on the example topology we had at the start of the lecture, where we had R1, R2, R3, and R4. Let's say that R1 is the DR and R2 is the BDR. Well, R1 and R2 will go to the full state with all of the other routers. On R3 and R4, they will go to the full state with R1 and R2 because those are the designated routers. But if you look at the state between R3 and R4, because neither one of those is a designated router, they will just be in the two-way state with each other. So routers which are not a designated router will just have a two-way relationship with each other. They're not exchanging full routing information directly with each other. The R3 and R4 will still learn each other's routes though, because that will be reflected down from the designated router. So when a link state changes on a router, if there is a new link comes up or if a link goes down and that's connected to a multi-axis segment, it sends a multicast LSU link state update packet to 224.0.0.6 
which is the multicast address for all designated routers. So it's just the DR and the BDR that are listening in for packets that is sent to that address. So again, with that example, if any of the routers R1, R2, R3, or R4 sees a link state change, it will send an update about that to 224.0.0.6, and both the DR and the BDR will learn about that change. Then just the DR, not the BDR as well, the DR multicasts the update to 224.0.0.5, all OSPF routers, so all OSPF routers on the link will learn about it. So that's why when there is any changes, it's just sent to the DR and the BDR. The DR then sends that out to the other routers on the link. So if there's any change anywhere, all the routers on the link will still learn about it. Okay, so that's how the DR and the BDR work. In the next lecture, I'll show you how to verify what's happening, which routers are the DR and the BDR, also how to influence what ones they will be if you want to do that with a lab demo. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to get the complete course ad free right now, then you can click on the link above my head or in the description to enroll in my CCNA Gold Bootcamp. It also includes full study notes, quizzes, and 150 pages of additional troubleshooting labs you can't find anywhere else.